we must kill JPEG. This is not a raw versus JPEG debate. This is about saving you thousands of dollars. This outdated format from the early 90s is incredibly wasteful, and you are the one who's paying for it. I'm going to show you how you can get the latest and greatest technology, the difference it will make in your life, whether you shoot JPEG or RAW, and how you can make that change possible. But first, I want to take a second and thank our sponsor, Squarespace. They're the ones who make this picture, this podcast possible. If you need any type of website, whether you're showing off your pictures or you're setting up a website for your business, Squarespace is the best way to do it. They provide beautiful templates that work on desktops or smartphones or tablets. They're incredibly simple to use, so you don't have to be a techie. But if you are, you can go in and make all those little customizations to make your site your own. If you're interested in your own trial, set it up for free at squarespace.com slash Tony. And if you love it, use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. 1992. Would you use a computer from this era to edit your photos? No way. But you are using a format from this era because that's when this was published. The JPEG still image data compression standard. The JPEG format changed the world, even though it's time to move on to something new. 2015 was an important year because that's when the successor to the JPEG format was finally standardized. You might hear it called by a few different names. HEIF, which people say as HEF, is the actual file format. This defines the sort of compression that is replacing JPEG. It's about twice as efficient as JPEG. HEIC is becoming the most popular container. It's just the file format. That's probably going to be the file extension on the pictures that you take with cameras like this iPhone that are smart enough to do it. When you use these compression technologies in video, it's called HEVC or sometimes H265, but really they're exactly the same technologies. In 2017, that's when Apple releases iOS 11. They make the HEF compression format standard. In fact, our customers now take a trillion photos per year. And they take a lot of video too, and today they do it in H.264. But now, with our latest iPhones and iOS 7, we're using HEVC, which is giving us up to two times better compression for camera captured videos, which means less storage space used on your device and less space used in the cloud. And we're applying these same techniques to replace JPEG capture with what we call H-E-I-F, High Efficiency Image Format. It's based on HEVC, and it also provides awesome quality images at half the size on your device. It makes so much sense, but in 2017, it was actually kind of a pain because nobody else had caught up with Apple. You couldn't open up the pictures in Lightroom or pretty much any other photo editing app. But they caught up pretty fast. In 2018, Adobe got on board, they started supporting the format, and now you could just import your pictures just like any other normal standard camera workflow. In 2018, all the barriers to working with these files pretty much disappeared, so there were only advantages and no more disadvantages. It wasn't until 2020, which hasn't actually happened yet, that camera manufacturers finally caught up. Canon, here in 2019, announced the forthcoming 1DX Mark III, their top-end professional sports camera, which in the past has cost about $6,000. The next generation will also support JPEGs, but it is supporting the HEF file format, and that's gonna give those pro sports shooters at the Olympics twice the buffer, twice the storage capacity. When they're setting hundreds or thousands of photos to the editors, it's going to take half the time, and the picture quality will actually be better. Part of that improvement in quality is 10-bit color. JPEG files have only 8-bit color. That means there are only 256 variations between totally bright and totally dark for any given color. If you take a picture that includes a large portion of the sky, the sky is not one color. It will go from very slightly brighter blue to very slightly darker blue over the course of your entire picture, and depending on how much JPEG compression there is, you'll see big blocks and chunks. That is the artifacts of the ancient JPEG compression. By providing 10-bit color, the HEF file format is providing 1,020 
24 variations or four times the number of levels. The HEF file format can also store multiple pictures within a single HEIC heck container. And that's why when you take a live photo on your iPhone, you can scroll through and pick the perfect moment. And I would love to see that in real cameras. You could also add proper depth mapping to the heck container. On our iPhones, we can use this to adjust the amount of background blur in our portraits. You could do that in your real cameras too, especially the Canon cameras, which have that dual pixel autofocus sensor. I told you earlier that JPEGs were costing you hundreds or thousands of dollars. So let's talk about that. Based on polls we've had in the past, it seems like a typical photographer over the course of their career could gather 100,000 or more photos. If you use a conservative 24 megapixel camera, that means that you'll have about 1.2 terabytes of files if you use JPEG or two and a half to three terabytes of files if you're shooting raw. Now, a two terabyte hard drive will only cost you 40 bucks or maybe even less. So that doesn't seem like a lot of storage costs, except what happens if that hard drive fails? You have a backup, right? You could just buy another $40 hard drive, except what happens if there's a theft? or a fire. The easy answer to this is to get some cloud storage. Go get a Google Drive account. That costs you $10 for one terabyte per month right now, but we decided we needed 1.2 terabytes, so that pushes us to $20 per month or $240 per year or about $2,400 per decade. And seriously, ask yourself, how long are you going to want to have access to these pictures? Is it just 10 years? Or maybe you want your grandkids to see it, your great grandkids to see it. You might want to store these pictures for 50 or 100 years. The storage companies have figured this out. They've done this math. They know that once you get your pictures copied to them, you're going to be paying them for that storage for a long, long time. And this is not just JPEG. This is raw files too. Most raw files are completely uncompressed or what they're what you call losslessly compressed. But there's no real reason for that. We could use lossy compression in an efficient way to reduce the sizes of these files by half or more without you ever being able to notice a difference. It's not just still images, but this also applies to video files. Most cameras that you're probably using are using motion JPEG or H.264. They're also using outdated formats. You'll also pay when you buy memory cards. Two 256 gig UHS-2 memory cards, you can get them cheaper, but the professional grade ones will cost you about $760 for the pair of them. With an efficient file format that consumed half the space, we could store the same number of pictures on a 128 gig card that would only cost $380 for two of them. So right away, this would save us $380 dollars. When I tell you how much it would cost the camera manufacturers to give this capability, you will lose your mind. Have you ever had your camera buffer because you took too many pictures in a row? You know, you're shooting continuously and it goes from shooting fast, click, 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 to slow, click, click, click. If you could cut the size of the files in half, you would basically double the buffer, meaning you could take twice as many pictures with the same amount of space. It also means that those pictures would copy to the cards twice as fast. On the flip side, you could actually use less expensive, slower cards and have the same pictures per second write speed. Another way that you could potentially save money just by changing this file format. Transfers from your camera would speed up too. Not just the traditional unloading pictures from your memory card, but tethering. If you're shooting live in a studio and you want to see the pictures on a computer, that, now that can be kind of slow. Wi-Fi can be terribly slow right now. The performance of that could be doubled without changing the bandwidth at all because the files are smaller. This would also enable new technologies like allowing your camera to send the pictures to cloud storage, either over Wi-Fi or over cellular connections like LTE or 5G. After a break, I'm gonna tell you why it's not that easy for camera manufacturers to implement this incredible new technology. But I'm also gonna tell you what you can do to get those camera manufacturers to take the those steps and save you personally all that money. I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. If you need a website to show off your pictures, even if they're in JPEG, go to squarespace.com slash Tony. In just a few minutes, you'll be able to create a website that shows off your photographic talent or your business and makes your pictures look amazing, whether people are using a computer, a smartphone, or a tablet. You'll be able to view analytics and see
see where people land on your site and where they leave your site, how many pages they view, and that allows you to optimize your business and even make more money. I suggest you check out Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony. You'll get a 14 day free trial. If you love it, use the coupon code Tony for an additional 10% off. Thanks Squarespace. Camera manufacturers haven't done this yet, and I'm sure if they could just snap their fingers, they would. The biggest part is the coding of it is extremely difficult. JPEG is actually really pretty simple to implement, even if you need to create your own libraries. Now, if you're writing a program for iOS or Windows or something, you simply use existing software development kits, SDKs, or application programming interfaces, APIs, and it makes it all really simple. But if you are Canon and you need to implement this software on their proprietary OS with their proprietary chip, you've got a lot of coding ahead of you to do. It's made even more complex by the need for compatibility with third-party software. That's incredibly complex because Hef and Heck are incredibly complex themselves. That's how they get more done. But there's just a one-time software development cost that will benefit millions of users for decades. So that cost would be immediately recouped. The hard part is it's the consumers who recoup the cost and the manufacturers who actually absorb the cost. So we need to make sure that it's worth their while. The half file format also requires more processing power. So you could double the performance of the processor or you could slow down how long it takes. Now, this same compression technology is used in H.265 and there are lots of cameras that record H.265 video. It can definitely be done. Maybe the biggest struggle for camera manufacturers is the patents though. Let's look at the official list of patent holders. You have Canon, Dolby, oh, all these GE, Godo, HFI. I don't even know the names of all of these companies, but it's a huge list. Samsung, Warner Brothers, these all own a piece of what goes into HEF. Now, there are ways to sort of get the rights to use all of these different patents in your technology. There are patent aggregators like HEVC Advanced that make agreements with all these different companies so they can just sell you one bundle saying, hey, you can use this on this particular device for this number of years. So that's fairly straightforward. What does it cost? Well, looking at their full pricing sheet, it kind of varies based on device. If it's a mobile phone or a tablet, you're looking at about 40 cents per device, but they're not allowed to sell the codec for use in devices that record in that format for commercial purposes. And I'm not exactly sure where most modern cameras stand on that. We do know it's possible since Canon has already done it with their top end camera. But even looking at what the commercial prices for these would be, it would probably be no more than two dollars and fifty cents per device. $2.50. That's what the camera companies have to pay, plus some upfront software development costs. Now, compare that to what it's costing you. Just in memory cards, you're probably paying $50 to $200 for the extra capacity and extra speed that you need to get the same performance out of the less efficient JPEG or uncompressed RAW files. And in your cloud storage, well, it's probably going to cost you thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars over the course of your life. So that $2.50 in licensing fees seems pretty insignificant. So how can we get the camera manufacturers to start valuing our costs and our experiences over their own development and patent costs? You can go to social media and find your camera manufacturer and reach out to them and say, hey, JPEG is outdated. Hey, I want the latest formats. I want H.265 video. I want the HEF file format. Tell them I would be willing to pay more for a new camera that had these technologies because I know I will recoup that upfront cost. If we do nothing, the camera companies will do nothing. They have proven that historically time and time again. I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. No matter what type of website you need, Squarespace is probably the right answer. You can create an online store. You can just show off your pictures and make yourself look great. You can make your business look amazing. Just head to squarespace.com slash Tony. You'll get a 14 day free trial. Set it up. Put your best pictures up there. It's a great experience, even if you don't end up using it long term. If you do love it, only then do you have to give them a credit card. And at that time, use the coupon code Tony and I'll save you 10% off. I want to thank the people who created the original JPEG standard, even as I'm hoping to say goodbye to it, because these 
people have changed the world as we know it. They are what has built the modern internet. I used the internet without images, and it kind of sucked. But when the JPEG format came around, and we started to be able to see images, it changed everything. And the internet has changed society as a whole. It has made the world smaller. It's the reason I can reach out to so many of you. Remember, it's not just JPEG, but the Motion JPEG video codec is built on top of that. So, let's thank a few of the heroes that made this possible. Dr. Joan L. Mitchell, who recently passed in 2015. When we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, you are one of those giants, Joan, and I really appreciate the work that you've done. You've changed the world. Eric Hamilton, thank you very much. Adrian Lichtenberg, you did fantastic work, and it has not been forgotten. Istvan Sebastian, sorry if I butchered your name, but I appreciate your work. We use it every day. All of humanity has benefited from it. I couldn't find everybody's pictures from the acknowledgments of this document, so I'm just going to read the rest of their names and do my best with the pronunciations. Aaron Gill at the company Zoran in Israel. Alien Ledger at CCETT in France. Herbert Loescheller at ANT in Germany. Michael Neer at Kodak in the USA. Takao Omachi at NEC in Japan. William Pennebaker at IBM in the United States. Henning Poulsen, KTAS in Denmark. Jorgen Vaben at Autograph in Denmark. Hiroshi Yasuda at NTT in Japan, and Graham Hudson at the British Telecom in the UK. You can see it was a worldwide team who made all of this possible. And if you see one of these people, give them a hug, give them your appreciation, and thank a nerd in general. Nerds don't get celebrated like other heroes, but they make the infrastructure that we build our lives upon, and they don't generally get appreciated. So thank you very much.